morning. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you all to our service today. This is the last Sunday of the present church here. It's known as the sun, fourth Sunday of end time, the last Sunday of end time, and it's Christ the King. It is kind of a culmination of what the whole church season, church year is all about. But it's a little bit different than what people might expect. When you talk about Christ the King, you expect a, perhaps a, a, a text or a lesson that has the glory of God just shining forth in every aspect. Well, actually it does, but it's in a different way from what human minds think. The glory of Christ really comes to us from the cross. And that is the apex of what our faith is all about, the cross. And so at the end of the church year, we return to that cross because without that cross, we would have no existence as God's children. We would have no salvation. So this is a culmination of the church year when we look at Christ the King, a different kind of king, a king who rules from the cross, but now a king who through his resurrection rules from heaven itself for the glory and for the welfare of his people. And those are the thoughts that are reflected today. It ends the past church year, but it also is an introduction to the new church year as we renew all of these thoughts once more. This morning we follow the order of the Matin service or the morning praise service, which is on page 45 in the Christian worship hymnal. And that service begins with the singing of our opening hymn, hymn number 216, Saints Behold, the Sight is Glorious. Thank mm -hmm. you.
day, that would be Psalm 47. You'll find that on page 85 in the front part of the hymnal. Psalm 47 on page 85. You who have received the devotions during the week probably recognize Psalm 47 was the, the center of what the devotions were based upon today as it takes our thoughts to our king who is above, our heavenly king, a different kind of king over all the earth. We, read, we sing responsibly the psalm this morning. We ask the congregation to sing the refrain portions. There are three of them. The second half of each of the verses, and then the glory be to the Father towards the end. So I will search for my flock and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in all the settlements of the land. I will lead them into good pasture, and their grazing land will be on the high mountains of Israel. There they will be down in good grazing land, and they will pasture on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will shepherd my flock. I myself will let them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will shepherd them with justice. 
Then I will raise up over them one shepherd, and he will tend them. My servant David will tend them, and he will be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be the prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Here ends the word of our Lord from the Old Testament. Our epistle lesson today is recorded in Paul's letter, his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 20 to 28. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is often known as the resurrection chapter because in many different ways it speaks of what Christ's resurrection means to us as those who believe in Christ as our Savior. Here is the guarantee that we too shall rise with him at the end through our faith. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ as the first fruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be done away with, Certainly he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, when it says that all things have been put in subjection, obviously that does not include the one who subjected all things to him. But when all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, in order that God may be all in all. Here ends the reading of the epistle. And in response to our first two lessons, especially this last one, we join in the singing of hymn 143. He's risen, he's risen, and takes us back to the resurrection and to Christ's rule.
recorded in the book of Matthew, the 27th chapter, beginning at verse 27. This takes us to just before Christ is led out to Golgotha to be crucified. As to what takes place when he is in uh, the Praetorium or the garrison of the Roman soldiers in Jerusalem. And they call him a king. But they have a different meaning behind this. They do this in mockery. And yet we see that it is through him and his salvation that he has provided for us on the cross that he truly is heaven's king as he rules over us eternally. We read in Matthew chapter 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the Praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful people, kindling in us the fire of your love. Alleluia. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 214. Hymn number 214. Thank mm -hmm.
Bible lesson for the day, for this last Sunday of the church here, known as Christ the King, but we see a different kind of king. We read the opening verses. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed in our Lord. You know, if you were not a Christian, you could possibly think this way. What would you think of Jesus? He's born in a tiny village, the child of a very humble, common Jewish girl. He grew up in Nazareth, a small town that was in the backwoods country of Galilee and Israel. He worked in a carpenter's shop with a man whom most people thought was his father. At the age of 30, he traveled the Baal, the whole countryside, like an itinerant preacher. Never owned a house, never wrote a book, never traveled more than 100, at most 150 miles away from his home. He never did anything which people normally aspire to. His own countrymen rejected him. The Jewish authorities condemned him to death. His closest friends deserted him. One betrayed him, another disowned or denied him, and the other simply fled from his presence. He endured proceedings in a court where a guilty verdict had been predetermined. Those who executed him gambled for what little clothing that he owned. And when he died, he was placed in another man's tomb. So if you were not a Christian, what would you think of this? Could you call him great on the basis of those things? Would you hail him as a king? I doubt it. When the soldiers hailed him as king in our text, they didn't really mean it either. They said it in scorn and in mockery of him. Why did they do this? Did they all do it just for fun? To get some kicks out of a man who was going to be condemned to death? Was it something that the soldiers regularly did, the Roman soldiers regularly did, as they carried out Roman justice? Perhaps Pontius Pilate had even ordered this. Or was there more to it? More than the soldiers could ever begin to realize. In the Old Testament times, God had commanded that the little Passover lamb was to be slaughtered in a way that the blood would flow freely from it. In fact, the Hebrew words for slaughter seem to indicate something that is beaten down and flayed, stretched out and extended so that the blood freely, or freely flows from it. Then the blood of the Passover lamb was literally and liberally splashed over the doorposts of the Jewish homes that were in Egypt at the time. Since the Bible declares Christ Jesus is actually the true Passover lamb that is sacrificed for us, Jesus didn't want to be killed in a simple way. Rather, he had to suffer a brutal death. From his body, the blood flowed abundantly. It began to drip to the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane. It stained the cross of Calvary, but it was really here in the headquarters of Roman soldiers in Jerusalem 
where it was poured out most as they intended to cruelly treat him. See, since Pilate could not find a way to let Jesus go free, convinced that he was innocent of anything that was brought against him, what could he do? He knew that the charges were all false. Perhaps if he had Jesus' body disfigured, the Jews would ask for Jesus to be freed out of pity for him, even if they didn't consider him to be their king. If that was Pilate's thinking, then how horribly the soldiers may have whipped Jesus. His entire body lashed and torn. It was here, even more than on Calvary, where the holy innocent blood of God's Son flowed most freely to wash away our sins. It was here that he was despised and crushed and then he would be led like a lamb to the slaughter, so that he might suffer sufficiently for our sake. The soldiers knew exactly what they were doing in a physical way, yet they were completely ignorant of that which was really taking place in heaven. Their words exposed their ignorance. They saw him as a foolish Jew who was rebelling against the higher power of Rome, calling himself a king in Caesar's place. But look at him, they thought. Kings have armies that back them. Where is his? Kings dress in royal robes. Where are his? Kings have signs of authority and power. Where are his? Didn't he just a few days earlier ride into Jerusalem on a holy donkey? That's not very kinglike. So he needs a king's welcome. The soldiers determined that they were going to give that to him. A crown. Jesus needs a crown. The spiny thorns that grew along the city's walls were going to serve as the soldiers wove a wreath out of them, placed it on his head, and pressed it deeply upon him. And the blood flowed. A robe. Jesus needs a kingly robe. He needs a royal colored robe. An old soldier's scarlet robe faded into a purplish hue would do. They threw it over his shoulders, and probably pressed it into his fresh wounds. A scepter. Jesus needs a sign of authority in his hand. A stick. That'll do. All the trappings of the king were now in place. They could rightly approach him. So the soldiers set up a receiving line. Perhaps up to 600 men. Because that's what a cohort held. Each taking his turn to greet Jesus. Falling down before him, they mocked him and they cried, Hail, King of the Jews! And they beat him with a stick. Who could be more inventive? Who could be more hilarious? Who could be more vulgar with his words? Such humiliation the King of Heaven received. <clears throat> This is where we see the words of the prophet Isaiah fulfilled. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Perhaps the soldiers would never have done this if they had any inkling as to the full identity of the one whom they mocked. He wasn't a criminal. He was no dreamer. He was no ordinary citizen, but he was of a much higher rank and authority than they could ever have imagined. With one word, just one word, he could have annihilated, annihilated all of them. Jesus endured such ignorance. Had they understood 
their mindless words and cruel activity perhaps would never have occurred. On the other hand, for our sakes, it had to happen this way. For God had promised it, and he had prophesied our deliverance from sin and death this way. The Apostle Paul later wrote to the Corinthians, none of the rulers of this age understood it. But the most amazing fact that this one who endured such ignorance and abuse forgave it all by saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. Jesus endured such ignorance of many. And then he forgives it all. That's a very different kind of a king. But it had to happen this way. So that we might have a savior. Were the soldiers the ones who were really behind it all? No. Isaiah explains, We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punish punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes, his wounds, we are healed. One of the early church fathers of the New Testament put those words this way. He was whipped for you, so that you could free he could free you from the whipping of eternal wrath. He was crowned with thorns for you, so that he could crown you in heaven. He was wounded for you, so that he could heal you. Since Jesus told Pontius Pilate, you would have no authority over me if it were not given to you from above. We have to view this in no other way than that the God in heaven had the whip in his own hand, and so pitiably scourged his own royal son in our place. If our hearts were not so often as ignorant of what we say and what we do as the soldiers were, we would understand and we would contemplate the trouble that our sins have caused and put upon our Lord. We would see and we would often repent of the way that each of us has helped to braid the whip and to press the thorns upon his head. But we often fail to show understanding either. For that reason, Christ in his merciful love allowed that blood to flow so freely to wash us clean of our sin. Had he not endured it, we wouldn't have a savior. And he could not have assembled to himself a people who love him as their Lord and King. Only he could do it, only he could endure it, only he could accomplish it in a way that counts for everyone. Out of heavenly love, he endured the ignorance of many so that we each could have a savior to which those who respond in faith say, Hail, our heavenly king. You see, this is what saving faith is all about. This is what it comes down to. Think about it and all that has taken place as you look back over this present church year at what has occurred. We started at Christmas with the birth of God's Son. We watched him in the Epiphany season show us through his preaching and his teaching and his miracles and healing who he exactly was. We saw him in Lent suffer and then die to pay for our sin. And then came that glorious Easter morning when he rose to give us the certainty of our forgiveness and our life in him forever. Then he goes back to heaven in his ascension so that he can rule over all things for the welfare of his people. To help us before he returns, he then sent the Holy Spirit to guide us, to teach us in our lives of faith. During the Pentecost season that spanned the whole summertime, he taught us how to live 
our faith in this world to his glory and to our own good. And finally, during these last weeks that we call the end times, he's assured us of his return and the glorious existence that will be. He did it all for us. Why? Because we were helpless. Just like the prophet said in the Old Testament lesson today, like sheep who could not make it on their own. See what love heaven's king has for you. This is a very important way to end the present church year and actually to approach the new year that lies ahead as we begin to see all of these events take place once more for our salvation. So God grant us the comfort and the strength that we need throughout the year to praise him in our lives of faith as our heavenly king. God grant it to us for his name's sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as we join together in the singing of the song, We Praise You, O God. You'll find that on page 48 in the front part of the hymnal. Page 48. <laughs> Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. For you are worthy, O Christ our King, to receive honor and glory and praise. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation you have called us into your kingdom and have made us priests to serve you, our God and Father. You have searched for us and found us. Led us to the green pastures and quiet waters of your saving love, so that we might enjoy peace and comfort for our souls. Come with your mighty power to break and defeat every evil plan and purpose of the devil, of the ungodly influences and ideas of the world around us, and of our own sinful nature. Use your power to calm the unrest among nations and peoples, so that your kingdom may spread and grow. You have destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Reign in our hearts that we may serve you more faithfully and speak more boldly to others of your saving love. Look, you say that you are coming with the clouds, and every eye will see you, even those who pierced you. For the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of Lords. And dear Lord, we pray on behalf of our family and our friends today. We think especially of those who are suffering through the different illnesses of this life, those we see who will undergo surgery this coming week, and Jane's mother who is recovering from a recent fall, and our members who are suffering the different adversities that come their way. We commend them all to your care, and as Lois undergoes surgery, we pray that you would be with her, that you would grant success to the care, the surgery that will be done, and bring about a full and speedy recover, recovery for her according to your good will. We ask that you would be with those who are sick and injured, bring them healing, relieve them of any distress, strengthen them in their faith, and grant them recovery according to your gracious will. And, O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. We ask that you would defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all that we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Again, we welcome all of you to our service today and pray that you've been strengthened in your faith by God's word. We will be here again next week for you who are online, so you can join us for that. We'll be beginning a new uh, season again as we start the Advent season. This coming Thursday, we'll have a Thanksgiving Day service at 10 o'clock in the morning. You can join us for that also. And we pray that the Lord will bless you in the week that lies ahead and grant you his goodness in all that you do. Thank you.